I never thought as a channeler, as Cryon, that I would do a program about something as elusive to many as Lemuria. In fact, I never thought that Lemuria would be a, a subject at all. Um, Lemuria is a word that seems to um, elicit all kinds of feelings from many, many people, and there's all kinds of ideas of, was it mythology? Was it actually there? Uh, what happened there and all? And I never thought I'd weigh in on it, just, just like I never thought I would be talking about King Arthur either until we went to, <laughs> to Bath and we did multiple channels on King Arthur. But here we are, again, in a, in a place where we're going to discuss this whole idea of Lemuria. Now, I can't, I can't open this can, the, this, this mythological place, without first going someplace else that is difficult for some. Why, if indeed Lemuria existed, why? There's always reasons for these things, especially when Cryon says things have to make spiritual common sense. But in this metaphysics, there's a lot of things that are eye-rolling. Eye-rolling to a general public that has never even heard these things before, or when I state them, will be the first ones to turn off this video. And, and that's because uh, it's, just, it's just too spooky and strange. So I'm not going to open the can fully until I give you a little bit of science. And, that, and I'll be very brief on this one. I don't know how many of you have heard about the Kepler telescope. The Kepler telescope put into space in orbit in 2009 had one purpose. And the purpose was to see if they could find other planets like ours. And they did it very cleverly all through the galaxy. You can't see a planet, but you can detect it from the things that are going around a star. You can see light change. You can see a star wobble. All of these things, this telescope was purposed for that. And it had 10 years, or now more, actually less. It, it, it gave a report in 2014, and I can tell you, but it's been there for 10 years. And the whole idea is, are there other planets like ours in the galaxy? Now, most astronomers will laugh at that, and they'll say, of course there are. It's like asking if, they're, if you're standing on a beach, if there are other beaches. It seems to be a process that happens absolutely normally. But we had to prove it, and we did. And, and when I give you the information that the 2014 report on the Kepler telescope gave us, uh, it, is, it is startling. What they found out, that in a habitable zone like ours, that's right where Earth is and how far it is from the sun, that's the habitable zone. In that zone, how many planets are projected based upon their research do you think that they're looking at in the galaxy that might have suns the same size as ours and be in the habitable zone and have Earths like ours? And the answer was, are you ready? 11 billion. Now, I like the 11 part. <laughs> <laughs> 11 billion. So just sitting there as a rational person, of those 11 billion, what are the odds, do you think, that some of them might have life like ours? for the same reasons we have life like ours. They've discovered the, uh, the basis of the chemistry of DNA in space. Um, they found that in space, the chemistry is the same, the physics is the same. It's, it's the same everywhere in our galaxy. So why not? So the idea of life on other planets or in other places is very, uh, I will say, very friendly to most astronomers today who are just doing the odds. But that pegged it for me. Where am I going with this? Why would I tell you? Because what Cryon said originally is that our evolution was sped up. We're here on purpose. We're here by design, which, by the way, is the title of Greg Braden's latest book, Human by Design. We're here on purpose. And the Adam and Eve story that we were given in Scripture is, is quite accurate, but it's metaphoric for what Cryon says, is that we were human beings looking like we do, and what happened about 200,000 years ago is that the Pleiadians from the star system, the Seven Sisters, which actually has nine planets, seven are visible in the sky, came to this planet, changed human DNA, seeded us, and started with information that was about spirit, about God, because they came from a place where they had experienced an evolution that was beautiful, almost like a graduate planet. 
Uh, Krein has even alluded to the fact that they may even look angelic. And that would then explain some of the, perhaps, appearances of what we call angels, even through Scripture. That Adam and Eve story, the way it goes is that we were here looking like us in the Garden of Eden, which is a metaphor for earth. There was Adam, there was Eve, a metaphor for all men, women, all men. And what happened is that we were given free choice. And that free choice then is for the duality, the dark and the light, and also a spiritual uh, component. So that Adam and Eve story, if you apply it to what I'm talking about with the Pleiadians, is eye-rolling. And yet, and here's where it gets good, if you come to my seminars, not a, it's not an advertisement, but if you do, <laughs> I go into this, and I'm going to show you wherever we went on this planet. It's so amazing, culture after culture, indigenous after indigenous, when we say, where did you come from, they point to the stars. And some of them actually say we came from the Pleiadians. And that would include the ones we met at Easter Island, brought out a statue and said, that's a Pleiadian. When we, when we go to Australia, they have a 3,000-mile song line where they sing the creation story, and it's all Pleiadian. And so these things are not as far-fetched as you might think. Why do I tell you this? Because it's the Pleiadians who were on Lemuria. Lemuria was supposedly an isolated mini-continent in the Pacific. Now, there's no, there's no um, record of any mini-continent. I'll get there in a minute. And this whole Pleiadian idea of being Lemurian had a reason and a purpose. It's isolated. And I want to I I throw this to Monica right now. What was the reason why the Pleiadians were on that particular island or what made it special? Part of what made it special was that it was isolated in terms of there was no escape from getting off the island. And so you had the Pleiadian teachers there the whole time. And why is that important? Well, I'll go back to my country, Australia, where I'm from, and the Aboriginals that are there, they have over 700 <coughs> tribes and dialects of language. So what that means is that over time, humanity tends to disperse and create variety. But in Lemuria, the whole reason was that, was to have it pure, no variety, to keep it sane. There was a sameness there for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. What about the Akash? And so the Akash, when it's such a strong imprint, you're only having, first of all, Lemuria was unique. You only ever had one soul incarnation. So you didn't reincarnate back Lemuria. to Lemuria. You did okay. not incarnate back to Lemuria. And there were a few Crying. exceptions, but Crying has said it was a one-time experience because you are setting the Akash for the planet. Now, what does that mean? It means that you get the original core spiritual truth given to you directly from a Pleiadian star mother, and that is so strong within your Akash that it pops out in later incarnations. And I'm going to reveal a few things later, but we're not quite there yet. All right. So hold that thought about the tremendous imprint in your Akash, because I want to reveal a few and things Amber, that are And Amber, this is not the first time you heard about Lemuria, <clears throat> because you heard it from uh, Sid. I did. Tell yeah. that story. Okay. Um, when I met Sid Wolf in 1998, he, uh, he had just moved from a spiritual community in Ramona, California, called the Lemurian Fellowship. And he and his family were there as part of that for 14 years. And they moved to the same street where I lived in Colorado. What are the chances of that? Yeah, <laughs> spirit has a plan. So that was really the first time I heard about it. And I didn't get any like, oh, I was there. You know, I know I had a lifetime or two or however many. Uh, I didn't get that when he told me those stories. But what I did get as a feminist growing up in the 60s, how they treated the women. And that attracted me. And we'll get to that, I yeah. think, in a moment as well. Yeah. So let's get back to the mini continent of Lemuria. Uh, did it exist? Now, there is no geological evidence at all that there was a mini continent in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. 
because the first thing we look at would be plate tectonics. It doesn't show that at all. In fact, the geologists would laugh and say it's impossible, it didn't exist, so you know, move on. It has to be a, a metaphor for something else. And then what happened is the crime channeled what happened. And this has a double story to it, and the story will first be what Cryon channeled, and the second thing will be what I discovered later, which gave me a big aha. Do you know about Hawaii? And if you've been there, do you know about the uh, active volcano that is still under Hawaii? It's called a hot spot of the planet. There's about 13 hot spots around the Earth where the magma is very, very close to the surface. And where that happens, you have the steam vents, you have eruptions continually. Uh, Hawaii continues to erupt. And we have several. I've been to one in New Zealand. Of course, we've been to one in Yellowstone. And I'm going to get to that in just a moment. What Kryon said was this, that this hot spot, this magma under the earth, got trapped and pushed up Hawaii. Actually, so it became the tallest mountain in the world, and it had a landmass of a small continent. Now, if you think about it for a moment, or maybe you don't know this, it's so interesting. What is the tallest mountain in the world? And the answer is Hawaii, if you measure it from the bottom of the ocean to the top. So it's already there <laughs> in the fact that if it were pushed up, even to two-thirds of its size, it would be at least the size of Mount Everest or higher. So here is Kryon's explanation of how Lemuria got to be seen or viewed or remembered as a mini continent. So it didn't have anything to do with plate tectonics at all. The hotspot pushed it up. And then, like um, so many other things, it went back down. And today, we have the result of it. Didn't go fully under. It went back down and became the Hawaiian Islands chain. You'll be interested to know that the lineage of the pure Hawaiians, who talk about their metaphysical lineage, not their Polynesian lineage, but the spiritual lineage, if they ask, where did you come from? What happened here? They will say, the Pleiadians landed here. This is Lemuria. And we had, that was the other, I would say, thing that really flashed me, when made me excited and, and gave me this, this, um, uh, this, this profound feeling of validation when I heard that from a, a, a Hawaiian kahuna um, who was very close to me for a number of years before his death. I had no idea what he wanted to tell me, and that was one of the things he, he wanted to say, which validated everything that Krein had said. I was alone in my um, hotel room. I spent a lot of time in hotel rooms when I travel. And on the TV came this program called How the Earth Was Made on the History Channel. I think you can still get this. And one of the things that I was almost snoozing, one of the things that caught my attention as I was there bleary-eyed after having done a seminar, almost falling to sleep, was what I saw. And what they went into in this one portion of this program was this. There were all kinds of little scratches in the rocks. And they couldn't figure out what they did or, or what made them. Now, geologists look at these little things as significant because something had to cause them. They all went in one direction. They were everywhere. And so they said, what happened here that would cause all these scratches? And they realized they had seen scratches like this before in places that had glaciers. Then they realized what had had to have, must have happened is there had to be glaciers in the caldera section of Yellowstone. And in order for that to happen, the hot spot must have pushed up that land high enough so that glacier formed on a very, very high mountain to create those scratches. And then it went down again. So suddenly, I'm all eyes and ears in realizing that is the exact scenario that Kryon gave for Lemuria to exist. I had never heard this before. As I said, I didn't sleep that night because I said, that is, it's not validation that it happened, but you know, it's coincidental validation because it happened in another hot spot. Perhaps it could then have happened in Hawaii. And then to have the, the validation from the um, Hawaiians and also, I, I don't know if we're going to get to this. If you go to my seminar, we'll talk about the history line of the planet. When we went to Easter Island, we've been there twice now, they talk about the ones who came from the sinking island, which would be Hawaiians, who came and founded Easter Island with the same creation story. So there we are with Lemuria's existence and the fact that there were Pleiadians on there. And that scratches the surface of what we really want to talk about today. The reason these lovely ladies are here today is because of something else that happened to me. 
And that is in 2017, we were in Hawaii in December. These ladies were there, and something, something startling occurred. I sat down to channel what I thought would be a normal loving channel from Cryon, and he started giving information about the Lemurian teaching wheel. Now that, those have heard this, got so much attention. People were drawing the wheel and giving it to me. Even though Cryon had given the proportions of it, they had their own. People were starting classes <laughs> on it just because of two or three channels that Cryon had had about. Everybody was reacting and saying, yes, we, re we realized there had to be something because we can visualize it or we remember it. So we decided to start teaching it. And then we realized we really didn't have that much information. But what we did have validated so much of what Cryon's channeling had been about Lemuria. Now let me tell you where the channeling has come from. You'd think, well, it's Cryon channeling, right? Yes, but it's not channeling that has occurred mostly in the Cryon seminars. It's channeling that has occurred in something called the sisterhood. Now at the same time, all of this Lemurian information was being poured out in the teaching wheel. You gotta put yourself in the place of some years prior to that, Something happened to Dr. Wolf. And this has now created something I want her to tell about, which is called the Lemurian Sisterhood, which is something that is worldwide, has captured the attention of so many women. And we're going to talk about the women particularly in just a moment, because this is what Crying has channeled. There's something very, very special about this. Tell the story. OK. Um, you know, I never stop being amazed at how this unfolded. Uh, and, you know, that's the wonderful thing about it, looking in the rear view mirror and you see that there was a plan. So the plan was for Maya Kosh to wake up to my lifetime in Lemuria. And in order to do that, these other things had to fall into place. One was meeting Sid Wolf and learning about Lemuria. Another one was finding my first cryon book and learning about Lee. That was before the internet was invented. Imagine. Oh. Oh. I, I had to dust that you off. You were four. <laughs> yes, I was, my mother told me about it. <laughs> but meeting Lee, Sid introducing me to Lee because they lived in the same city, uh, I, I met you in Santa Fe, New Mexico in uh, 1999. And that was just the beginning of another step of then I became a host for you in Boulder and then I became a producer of the Journey Home Workshop and the Discovery Workshop. And then Lee asked me to travel with him on the road doing these seminars that we now do, still do. And it was after several weekends, back-to-back -back weekends of those seminars where Dr. Todd was doing the tones, Robert Coxon was playing music, I was doing meditation, and you were channeling. And this was happening all weekend, every weekend. And finally, something in my stubborn, very resistant, double Torian Akash just <laughs> went. <laughs> <laughs> and I had an Akashic awakening. I, was, I went to a place. Uh, in my consciousness that I never tried to get to, I didn't know existed, uh, I didn't, wasn't able to interpret until I talked to you, Lee. And so the, the, the first Akashic awakening, uh, the actual day, was September 9, 2011, which is 9 9 11. And then I got a chance to talk to you during a discovery workshop when you and I had a little time off and Sid was on the stage. And I told you the story of this and that was 10, 10, 11. And when I told Lee, I was a little reticent. I didn't know what, what had taken place, but I could feel it was something. And it didn't have to go anywhere. It didn't but I wanted some help interpreting it. And it, actually, I was kind of hoping it wouldn't go anywhere because I had a very busy practice, healing practice. I was you know, doing lots, managing all of our buildings. My son was living with us, going to college. I had a husband and a, a life. And uh, so I very patiently listened to the story very quietly just till I finished. He was just nodding his head. And at the end, I said, so, what do you think? And he just, he put his hand on my arm like that and he said, it's okay. And in that moment I thought, I don't have to do anything. Cool, 
he said. <laughs> and little, then, little did you know. And, yeah. and then in the next nanosecond, he said, and here's what I want you to do. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we're headed to Argentina in November. And I want you to have a workshop for the women there, because we were going to celebrate 11, 11, 11. So here I was saying yes to doing a workshop in a language that I don't speak about <laughs> something that I don't know anything about. What's the problem? Yeah. <laughs> OK, of course. Yeah. So that was really the first uh, Lemurian Sisterhood Sacred Circle, although it wasn't called that yet. When you finally got them going, what happened in your life that really kicked you? Sid's death, I think, yeah. What did it feel like? Uh, besides the oh. grief, besides, <laughs> and I don't mean that. I mean, yeah, that part. When, when you take a look at your Akash, your awakening, all these things, when his passing, yeah. did you realize that that may have had a significant reason to perhaps get you to where you're going today? Well, I always trust, at least in my mind, that everything happens for a reason. But when your beloved passes, it's not such a, you know, like, yeah, oh, that happened for a reason. It's not like that. But what I did know was that I had this amazing family around me and people who cared about me and loved me and were there with me during that time because I was hosting you that weekend. So you were already there, my son was there, my family was there. But what unfolded from that was finding out that I was just really being prepared for what was next. And that was the reason Sid was in my life at all, was to prepare me for what was next. So the sisterhood started basically before that, but it got going then. And the thing that has written Basically, the book that you participated in, yeah. that you've written, has been the channelings all about Lemuria, which have come from the sisterhood meetings yes. that have been every single week. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I started that 11 11 11 meeting being the first one. And then uh, 2012, 12 21 2012 in Hawaii, that was an amazing meeting out under the stars in Lemuria. And then all through, um, and then Sid passed in 2013. So I had those two really significant meetings. And then two weeks later, he was gone. So right, I think in March, I started traveling with you again and having meetings. But it still wasn't called the Lemurian Sisterhood. And so all through 2013, that started to morph. And when you came back to being hosted in Boulder, I was having a Lemurian Sisterhood meeting that night, too. So it's January 10, exactly a year to the day of Sid's passing, 2014. And Lee walks up to me and says, how would you like to have a cryon channel at your meeting? Yes. <laughs> and he hadn't said anything in 2013, all the meetings that we were at. And during that channel, which two people recorded and didn't get recorded, mm -hmm. uh, it, my uh, Lemurian name was revealed, Meli Ha. And also, it was revealed by Cryon that I could not do, Cryon couldn't come into the sisterhood until one year had passed. That name always intrigued me, too. When Crime gives these kinds of things, of course, I'm not really there to yeah. uh, scope it out. One That's the, also a good point. One of the things that you did that I like is you went to uh, Hawaiian Kahuna yeah. and asked her, what does the name mean? And, you know, yeah. Does it mean anything, or is it just sounds? Yeah, because we have our own Kahuna, you know. <laughs> kahuna Kalei Alahi. Uh, and I emailed her right away, and I said, what, you know, and I told her what happened at the meeting, and what does this name mean? And she so beautifully interpreted it. Uh, the mele is a gift. It means a gift or a celebration. So it's M-E-L-E -E, apostrophe H-A. And the ha is the sacred breath, just like in the word aloha. Mm -hmm. And when Hawaiians say that to each other, they do something called Pony, and they touch foreheads and nose and hold arms, and they share a breath. 
and that's their greeting. So all my life, I've been involved with breathing things. So it was quite, it's still quite so honoring and beautiful and, and appropriate. So even before we go further, just to review this, we've got uh, channels that are occurring specifically on uh, a certain place for the sisterhood. And if all of the hundreds of crying channels on YouTube and whatever, they're not, people are not going to find them even on my site Right. Uh, links, but it, it's your sisterhood yeah. page yeah. where there and there's more than fifty. There's almost so sixty far. now. Almost sixty now, yeah. and they're in many languages. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put um, uh, your site on the screen so people can see okay. and go there and experience those channels. And so this is where all this information has come from that now then got then put in this book. And Monica, at what point did you look at this and go, this has got to be a book? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was quite a process. And it's funny, only now I'm looking back and my first book I wrote was The Gaia Effect. And even back then, when you talked about people were so interested in Lemuria, I thought, my gosh, we need a book on Lemuria. And you just said to me, Nah, there's not enough information. Don't focus on that. So um, it, did, I, did, I, did I really sound like that? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, and so, really, it was intuitive to do the Akash because there was so much information on the Akash. Yeah. And now I look at spirit and how it brought Dr. Amber Wolf into my life, yeah. and then we had the sisterhood information come through. We had the work from a very talented gentleman called Dr. Todd Overkides, who has developed something called a pineal toning technique, which was founded from experiences in Lemuria. So I have all these people in my life that come with Lemuria knowledge and information. And so it was about the timing, the timing mm -hmm. of it. I always wanted to do this, but it was the timing of when to do it and when the information would come through. The biggest thing that's hiding that I haven't revealed yet and that I, I, I want now to do is why a sisterhood? And why do I have two ladies sitting here specifically? What is it with women and Lemuria? And why the title, The Women of Lemuria? So let me tell you what Cryon said. Mm -hmm. I still get chills with this because this is something, when you hear this, this is uh, happening on our Earth. Uh, right now, as consciousness starts to develop into a higher, more mature level, and some people are starting to see this intuitively, the teachings of the sisters who came from the seven sisters and changed our DNA was this, that the gender of female is the gender for teaching spirituality, period. <laughs> and the, the, yeah. <laughs> Thank you to the three ladies who started the, uh, no. <laughs> Let me explain this. It is intuitive. Women have more compassion. They raise children. They're the life givers. They have more intuition. We've known this. Psychologists have known this. And yet almost all of the teaching on this planet has gone to male heavy, if you've noticed. Then I would say to this audience, how do you like it so far? You know, <laughs> has it worked? And the answer is no. no. Now we're starting to get something happening. It's an understanding and a realization. What if that's true, that all along, that women should have carried the mantle of spiritual teacher? Now, this does not necessarily say that men can't do it. It's just that the women are better equipped for it. When you take a look at raising children and what has to happen intuitively for women, you see all of the attributes of a, a shaman. Those are the things you're going to want to see. Uh, crying is channeled this so many times. It says, you know, when you're a child, whether you're male or a female at a certain age, who are you going to cling to when you're in trouble? It's your mom. This, this is where it's at. And so crying's big information about Lemuria was one of the main teachings there was for women. Now, that Lemurian teaching wheel was for men and women. But at a certain age, it split off. And the women were taught certain other things. The men were taught other things, all spiritual. But the women actually were in a class for shamanship. Now, this is carried over into the Akash. And you have so many healers and whatever and through history. And you find most of them 
are women. You find the witches and all these, and they awaken, and somebody sees the magic they have and kill them because they don't understand. This is all through history. You start to see this awakening being squashed. And now there is something happening on this planet, and it has to do not just with awakening to this. It's awakening to common sense. It's awakening to, um, I, I would say, uh, humans, the way they treat each other. And we have the Me Too movement. Now, I want to tell you something about this. This is, this is not a women's issue. I think this is a respect issue of humans. I think as we start to mature and grow up, we're starting to see things in a different way. Now, how does this relate to anything and while they're sitting here? I want you to hear it from them, too, because you have a sisterhood, not a brotherhood. And there are men who will say, well, what about the men? And I'll tell you what crime has said about that. It says that when you have specific things that both genders are good at, they don't necessarily find themselves in the past wanting to do them. Men are not standing in line to give birth. You know, they're not saying, well, give me a chance. <laughs> and it's not, because yeah. this is what the women are equipped for. This is what they do. And part of that is motherhood. And part of that is the emotions and the intuition and the compassion and the kindness and all these things you have for a child. Not that men don't have it, but they're better equipped for it. And so Christ says it's not about equality. It's about what they're better at. So I want to throw that in your lap, and I want to say, what do you say, you know, when men come to yeah. you and say that? Well, and, and that happens quite often, that when we're at a weekend, and I'm going to have a Lemurian sisterhood meeting on Saturday night, and the men are like, well, what about us? <laughs> and I say, well, what about you? <laughs> 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 because I understand. I understand the desire to be honored, and that's what the Lemurian Sisterhood meetings are about, about honoring and empowering the divine feminine. And who wouldn't want that? Of course men want that. But I'm not a man to be able to teach to men. And so what Kryon has given us is honoring ceremonies for the men. And they don't happen every time we have a Lemurian Sisterhood, but they happen when the energy is right. And it's a very, um, it's a really simple ceremony, but it's a way to connect with men and women. Um, you know, there's eye contact, there's things that are, we sing, and it's a, it's a very sacred time of honoring. But it's not all the time, because the men in Lemuria knew that they were okay. They didn't have to have a Lemurian brotherhood because they trusted the women to do what they were doing, and they did what they did. But our society for thousands of years has created so much disparity that the closest we can come to it is trying to be equal. And who wants that? We've already tried that. When women's lib happened and women went to the workplace in you know, suits and ties and got paid half as much, and then the divorce rate went up. So that's not a great model either. So the opportunities should be equal. Yeah, like the Equal Rights Amendment, yeah. equal opportunity yeah. for men and women. Women didn't have it then, and now you know, it, men are understanding why more and what and it was it's like. Coming, it's coming yeah. to fruition. Monica, yeah. you had to pour through all of those channels. I'm still amazed that you came up with the ones that uh, made the book and were succinct. Um, and then most people don't know it, and this was it laid on me to answer questions, because as soon as the channels happened, your inquiring mind had a question. Well, how did they do this? What was the process of this? You know, what happened here yeah. and there? That's all in the book. And crime started answering and answering and answering. Did anything, um, oh, why, that's the book. <laughs> Look at that. Why, I'm glad you are. Yeah. It's gonna, <laughs> Were you uh, sitting on that book the whole time? What, what? Uh, leaning on it. You yes. leaning on it? Okay, I asked you, you to you bring You know, it. a girl never reveals her secrets. That's true. You should know that by now. All right. So, uh, um, was there any, in all of the questions and answers and all these, and we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about as many as you want to, what, did anything surprise you? Well, I think one of the things that surprised me, and it's on the topic of the Lemurian language, mm. and... There's a little phrase, and I'm not probably not saying it correctly, but it's something along the lines of a key yai fractus. Mm -hmm. 
And Crichton says, well, it sounds like a formula, right? And in fact, the Lemurians had a, well, it was more the star mothers, had a temple of rejuvenation, which set back the body clock through magnetics and the geology, very clever, sophisticated temple. And above that was that inscription, Akiya Ephractus. And Crichton said, what does it mean? And the translation is, the solution to your problems lay at the feet of practical things. So we tend to want to get on a cloud and float mm. and, and be spiritual and meditate. But here was the true reason is that you have to be taking care of the practical before you can start doing the esoteric. And that, I think, applies today even more than ever. Yeah. We can't isolate ourselves. We can't just sit in a cloud and meditate. We've got to take care of the practical things first. We've got to take care of essential, fundamental things, treatment of women, children, animals, treatment of the planet, treatment of each other. All of those things, the practical things, have to be taken care of first before you go to the esoteric thing. So that was a surprise, which I absolutely loved. And I want to read out, if I may, one Q&A from the book, which I think is just as relevant now. So with everyone's permission, I hope I can do that. Uh, here was the question that I asked. Given the similarity between the teachings of Buddha and Kryon, and the development of the Dharma wheel within Buddhism, was Buddha a Lemurian? And so Kryon answers, yes, very much so. Remember we talked about that imprint sticking into your Akash. So if that was the experience and you come into the planet, it's probably going to be a male because society will respond more to a male with that knowledge than a female. But anyway, here's what Kryon continues saying. The core teaching of the Pleiadians in Lemuria sticks tremendously into the Akash of the old soul who experienced it. Hence, it makes sense that in the early days of spiritual evolvement of belief systems, the concepts would reflect the teaching wheel in Lemuria. And so the masters who started these systems were those who were selected to remember the Akash in acutely evolved ways. And those at the heart of what is today called Hinduism and Buddhism, they were old souls specially selected for this. So let's expand on that just a bit. First of all, remember, in these early historic times of your current civilization approximately 6,000 years ago, things were linear, they were simple, and they had to be understood by those that were never used to any system. So the development of gods within these systems, they were not actually gods at all, but they were energy helpers. So some took away negativity. Some were good for good fortunes. Others helped with fertility. And others helped with health. So the statues and the multiple energy helpers, they actually allowed humans to see and feel the unseen. However, take a look at those principles and the doctrines of those early systems. Number one, no prophet. Remember, Buddha himself did not claim to be a god or a prophet. He was just an enlightened man. Number two, reincarnation. The original intuitive idea of the journey of the soul. And number three, karmic energy. So the idea of the energy of your past life being part of your current one. And finally, uh, not finally, number four, nirvana, <laughs> the ability to raise yourself up into ascension. And then finally is five, God inside. Seeing the God in you and in others. So therefore, if you truly understand what I'm teaching here, you will begin to realize that the entire New Age movement is a return to the beginning. It's the study of esoteric information on the earth, and it's a return to the core information given by Pleiadian star mothers. It's beautiful, it's benevolent, and it's for the magnificent human. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to put you on the hot seat for just one more time. Okay. Um, you have a women's meeting. It's called a sisterhood. You've talked about ceremony. I know their song. Yeah. 
What's practical about it? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for that, Lee. You know, one of the things that I love about the work that we do together is that I get to teach practical stuff every weekend. And Lee does the esoteric stuff and then the scientific stuff, and I get to teach the practical stuff. So in terms of the Lemurian Sisterhood meeting, the practical part is reminding women that we used to gather in community, mm -hmm. that we used to call certain times of the month sacred, mm -hmm. that we used to have ceremonies for the moons or for the solstices. We used to do that together, and this may awaken something in someone that says, I remember that. Are you saying like an um, awakening of wisdom? Perhaps they're calling on yeah. the original information from the Star Mothers at exactly. this point in time and awakening to a wiser countenance. Because we all have that in us. Mm -hmm. And I see, it, I see it in the faces of the women in the audience. Sometimes there are tears, sometimes there's goose flesh, sometimes when they leave, they, they don't want to leave. They, you know, they want to take their community with them because they're remembering, and that's the practical part. It was um, a man named Guru Deva. I would like, Monica, to tell you just a little bit, very briefly about who he was, mm -hmm. that opened a Hindu monastery in the island of Kauai, on Hawaii, and uh, first of all, would you, would you, from memory, if you can, tell just a little bit about who this guy yeah. was, and then I'll finish that. Yeah, absolutely divine human called Guru Deva. That was his shortened name. But he was born in Oakland, California, back in 1927. <laughs> but his akash was so rich with Hinduism. In his 20s, he traveled back to India, and he studied Hinduism. And over time, he became known as the most strictest traditional Hindu guru. He was the inherited guru for two and a half million Sri Lankas. He wrote over 30 books on mysticism and yoga. He established over 50 temples around the world, including the one on Kauai, mm -hmm. Hawaii. And he was also awarded the Youth Aunt Peace Award by the United Nations. And when he died, he was considered a living example of enlightenment and awakening. This man opened that a uh, monastery in uh, Kauai, and he wrote a book. Uh, he actually channeled it and released it, um, and it was called The Lemurian Scrolls. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. It's a, it is a Hindu book. Uh, I'm not necessarily rec recommending you go get it, but I just want to tell you the title, The Lemurian Scrolls. And when you go there, the monks, those priests who were on that, um, that Hindu place will tell you that he believed that Hawaii was Lemuria. So we're looking at all kinds of validations from places we never thought that are more mainstream than you think. And I think that people are starting to awaken with the idea that Lemuria was not a myth at all and actually existed as the teaching point. Crime says it eventually started going under, this uh, series of islands that the Lemurians didn't know who lived there, whether it was going to sink all the way down. It was pretty dramatic. It shook the earth. Um, there was just a lot of reforming of the mountains and all that took place, and so they left. And so they left, they went to Easter Island, they went to New Zealand, they went to the west coast of the states that currently, and lots of things. You'll, you'll know all of those things uh, from the channelings, both the sisterhood uh, and the book that are there. There's, there's one other thing uh, before I'm going to do something special here, and uh, I want to just turn to you. We're in Hollywood. Is there somebody you want to talk about? Yeah, <laughs> this is so fun. And this is where I was saying about the Lemurian experience, it sticks in your Akash. And we just heard that from Cryon. So this is something fun for me, hopefully for you. So one of the attributes of being Lemurian, what does that mean for you today? And I'm going to just reveal a Lemurian that was identified in the book. And this particular Lemurian would mm. never be caught, well, I'm assuming, would never be caught dead in a meeting like this. <laughs> and the person's name is Steven Spielberg. Now, Cryon talked about the pineal tones that Dr. Todd was doing and the toning sequences. And he described a Lemurian who remembered that and created it in a movie. Now, the movie was called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And this demonstrates that you do not necessarily have to be on an esoteric pathway 
to still impact the planet from compassion, from wisdom, from benevolence and love. And Lee and I recently tuned into a program called James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. Now, one of those episodes has Steven Spielberg being interviewed, and he's asked about that movie. And he describes as a little kid being woken up by his father and taken out to lie down on the ground and see all these shooting stars up above. Now, that experience was replayed in the movie. And there's a scene where that's recreated. Now, when he tells James Cameron about having that experience and said, if I ever get the chance to make a movie, I want to put that scene in and I want to make those visitors benevolent. How many alien movies do we know where they're benevolent? <laughs> so all of that to show how the expressions of being a Lemurian soul Things are not always as they seem. Hmm. What I want to do, um, I didn't really make this uh, plan. If there was time, I thought it would be all right, is to close this program uh, just with a summary and then something special. Uh, you, for those of you who know and watch me, you know it's coming because I took off my glasses. <laughs> 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 I believe Lemuria existed. I believe the channeling is compelling. I believe the indigenous around this planet who believe that the star sisters from the seven sisters arrived uh, is, is accurate and true. I believe Greg Braden's book, scientific, scientific book, which talks about the fact that we have 23 chromosomes and everything under us that's supposed to be where we came from has 24 is significant. It looks like we were designed. Something happened. I believe that. I believe there's a lot of evidence that points toward this metaphysical idea. And if you believe this, it makes us not only special, but it makes things on this planet extra, I would say, benevolent. Um, apart from what we've been told is even human nature, that things are starting to shift and change, and that's what Crian speaks about. So thank you, ladies, very, very much for all of this. Thank you. Thank you. What I want to do is what I call a mini channel. So we're going to do a cryon channel right now. Uh, we don't often do this uh, in video. And the reason is this, is that it can go anywhere, it can be played anywhere, and it will be. And cryon said originally to he said, uh, be careful where you channel. He said, make sure it's for people who want to hear it. Instead of somebody clicking through channels at night on the TV and coming across cryo. And that is so, this is a little bit of a departure from that, except that this video is one that you had to want to see. And that's why you're watching it. So it's not something that is on um, a mass media, at the moment anyway, where somebody's going to come across it by accident. So I would ask the audience just to get in a, in a, a mode that would be conducive to meditation. This mini channel, they don't last long. Sometimes they're very profound just in the energy they carry. Yeah. Greetings, dear ones. I'm Cryon of Magnetic Service. Humans are not truly aware of what channeling is. They think it's something occult. They think it is the human who is taken over by some spirit that's inappropriate and comes through. And for eons, it's been looked at as suspicious, not of God, and something that you don't want to allow to happen to you. Dear ones, my partner let me in 30 years ago. And when he did, he lost a lot of friends. And those were friends who said, don't do it because it's Satan. And Satan will come into your life and change things. 30 years ago. Every single time, dear ones, I sit with my partner in the chair, I tell you about the love of spirit. 
Do you want to know the test of when something is beautiful and accurate and true? It's how many years is it the same? Is there a trick involved when you tell people that the earth is not there to victimize them? Is it a trick to tell people that they are magnificent in the eyes of God? Is it a trick? Or is it the truth? Do you believe you're here on purpose? There are so many who question that. And I'm here to say you are. And that the God, the creator, the, the source, whatever you want to call that, that made humans in the image of love, knows your name. Knows your name. And when you turn off this program or leave this building, there's a group of multidimensional beings you cannot even imagine who walk out with you, who are there to hold your hand if you wish. This is the core truth. Lemuria was real, giving you profound information about your magnificence, teaching about the stars, teaching about so many things that have been lost today, thrown away, teaching you the, the profundity of a connection with Earth, the planet, that all the indigenous have and that today modern society has thrown away. The message of crying has always been the same. This is the shift. You're in it. Did you notice? Everything is changing. Human nature, weather, did you notice? And in these times, there is an awakening and a chance for you to look and say, am I magnificent in the eyes of God? And when you do that, it's almost like permission for those around you to hold your hand or you to feel the chills that say you are. And that you're not here by accident. And there's a reason for your existence. And as you start to observe and absorb these things, your personality starts to change and you start to realize you're kinder, more benevolent. You're more compassionate. What a trick. It isn't. It's core truth. These are the things, dear ones, that I want you to look at and, and put the test to. Is it a trick when I tell you God loves you more than anything because you are made in his image, the image of compassion and love? The planet is starting to awaken to this and changing its ways. The things that are dark and not appropriate are starting to raise their heads and then be seen and dealt with and put away. We said it was coming, and here it is. This is the end times. It's the end times of darkness. It's the beginning of a light you didn't expect. It's everywhere. People who would never hear this channel, never come to a meeting like this, are starting to see it profoundly. That's real. It's not a trick. I leave you with these things and these comments. Blessed is the human being. For they are loved dearly by God. And each one has a magnificent soul that shines as bright as any sun you've ever seen. And these are the times where the veil is starting to lift and humans are starting to see what is appropriate and inappropriate, treating each other better because of it. Those, again, who would never listen to this channel are starting to feel all of the things that I've given you of a potential of a raising human consciousness now for 30 years. It is the beginning, dear ones, the end of darkness, as you have seen it and known it, and the beginning of an evolvement of human spirit in a beautiful way, where you're going to start understanding, indeed, you are seen and loved and beautiful. You belong here. There is no trick here. And so it is. Thank you all so much. For